In this SY3 screencast, we're going to move away from talking about democracy solely in a UK context, and we're going to look at uh, democracy in a global context. And this is the last of our building block screencasts on the theme of democracy. Now, although most countries in the world today will at least make the claim that they are democracies, in the relatively recent past, the opposite was the case. So, for example, during the Cold War era, uh, from the end of World War II uh, up until the end of the 1980s, probably around uh, two-thirds of the world's countries would have been better characterised as authoritarian states. And the Cold War was a rivalry between uh, the USA and the Soviet Union, or Russia, that was played out globally. And the Cold War represented a clash of civilizations, really, because the USA was meant to stand for uh, a system of representative democracy combined with a capitalist economy, whereas in contrast, Russia or the Soviet Union uh, stood for uh, a one-party system of authoritarian government combined with a communist economy which in practice meant that the government controlled industry. Virtually the whole of the world became embroiled in the Cold War, with the planet being divided into three worlds. The first world, represented by the countries in blue on this map, consisted of the USA, Western Europe and any other country that embraced capitalism and a more or less democratic form of government. So the countries that you can see on this map that had the colour blue were the only parts of the world during the Cold War era where democracy was firmly entrenched as a political system. The second world, represented um, on this map by the countries in red, consisted of the Soviet Union and its satellites, so mainly Eastern Europe, uh, China and Cuba. And then the third world, represented on this map by the countries in green, was everybody else. But neither the US or the Soviet Union wanted any of these countries in the third world to remain neutral. So during the Cold War era, nations were meant to pick sides and side either with America or the Soviet Union. And this actually led uh, America, a democratic nation, to actually support some fairly authoritarian regimes, such as the military dictatorships in Latin America uh, during this particular period. Now, almost everybody in the West, from trained academics to average citizens, believed that the communist systems of authoritarian political rule were deeply entrenched and had become a permanent feature of global politics. So few people, if any, predicted the dramatic course of events that began to unfold in 1989 as one communist regime after another collapsed in a series of so-called velvet revolutions that swept Eastern Europe. And the catalyst was the tearing down of the Berlin Wall uh, in 1989, which was a symbolic moment in the rapid dismantling of communism in the East uh, giving way to an unprecedented spread of democratic institutions. So the end of the Cold War meant that democracy spread from the First World to many countries in what was known during the Cold War era as the Second World. And this led the uh, American political scientist Francis Fukuyama to famously argue that there was no longer any credible alternative to capitalism and representative democracy in a famous essay that he wrote called The End of History. Now, one region of the world that is held on to authoritarian systems of government have been the North African countries and the countries of the Middle East. However, in late 2010 and throughout 2011, a series of pro-democracy protests and demonstrations across the Middle East and North Africa that became known as the Arab Spring 
raised hopes that democracy might spread to this particular region of the world. Now we'll look at the Arab Spring in more detail uh, during the course, particularly the use of uh, new media uh, during this particular uprising. But the aim of the Arab Spring was to get rid of the authoritarian dictators that were the leaders of the countries in this particular region. And the, the spark for the Arab Spring was when a poor fruit seller in Tunisia uh, set himself on fire. And this sparked uh, demonstrations uh, across Tunisia uh, against their dictator Ben Ali. And in just 28 days, those demonstrations uh, led to Ben Ali uh, resigning as the leader of Tunisia. And this gave hope to people uh, throughout the Arab world and the protests of Tunisia uh, quickly spread uh, to Egypt where people started to occupy uh, the main square in Cairo, uh, Tahir Square, uh, in protest against the dictator of Egypt, uh, Mubarak. Now the removal of the Egyptian dictator paved the way for elections. However, if you've been following the news, you'll probably be aware that the elected president of Egypt has recently been removed in a military coup. And in many countries that were part of the Arab Spring, uh, there is instability, there is sectarian conflict, and there is even civil war. So the optimism from about 18 months ago that democracy would spread to the Middle East and North Africa uh, is not uh, as great as it was. However, the experience of the Arab Spring will probably make it difficult for authoritarian leaders to rule in the way that they have done uh, prior to the political awakening that we call the Arab Spring. Now, despite the global spread of democracy, in many countries where democracy is most established, uh, such as Western Europe, uh, the US and the UK, people are talking about a crisis of legitimation. People are talking about our democracy being in trouble because people do not trust the democratic institutions that exist in their countries. So, for example, the number of people who vote in elections has declined considerably since the early 1990s and people have lost trust of those individuals who are in positions of political power. So the sociologist Manuel Castells argues that there now is a crisis of trust, a crisis of legitimation in almost every established demo democracy. Another problem with democracy is the growing power of a number of international and transnational organisations which are not democratically accountable to ordinary people. So, for example, the Bread and Woods institutions of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank have an enormous influence on poorer countries and, more recently, uh, certain countries that are heavily in debt uh, within Europe. And they have enormous influence over these uh, governments, even though their democratic credentials are questioned. So, for example, this is a bit of graffiti from Ireland. Ireland is a country that at the moment is heavily in debt and is receiving uh, money from the IMF. And as a condition of receiving that money, what the piece of graffiti is indicating is that economic and political policy within the Republic of Ireland is being driven by the priorities of the International Monetary Fund rather than the people of the Republic of Ireland. 